For quite a while, I've been asked on my channel, how do you optimize a data pack? How do you go from uh, something that is incredibly laggy to something that is playable? And today I'm going to go over a few methods that you should always keep in mind as you're making a data pack or as you revise your data pack to help make it go faster and to fully utilize your space. So unrelated to a data pack, one of the obvious first ways to fully optimize your at least entire world would be to use as little redstone as possible. This may be obvious to you, but the way that redstone works and the way the data pack works is very different. If you have redstone in your world, the game has to check it every tick. If you have a function file that's not being played just sitting in your data pack folder, it's not taking up any space that the game has to constantly check. So this redstone that's just kind of going in a circle, even if I turn it off, that's still more data that the block has to that the game has to check, more block data to look through, uh, more information to seek. So making as few redstone contraptions as possible or even none can make your world run a lot faster and one of the ways you can do this is to just really know all the different substitutions you can do for commands with data packs for example this redstone kind of delay circuit can be easily remedied with a slash schedule and scheduling another function it may seem obsessive to have uh, one tell raw in a function and then it schedules another function that just has a tell raw and a schedule in it But doing this can actually help optimize your world and make it run faster Especially if you have a huge storyline with like hundreds of text lines. This will save you in the long run another really easy way to uh, increase the efficiency of your data pack by a large amount is to reduce the frequency that your commands are being run. This can be done by creating a slow clock, which isn't 20 ticks per second, which would be in your main function, uh, for certain things that don't need to run as fast. For example, perhaps I need to check um, a certain area for players updating blocks or placing things, you probably don't need to check 20 times per second because they're not going to place the blocks that frequently. You can easily accomplish this by creating a second function that is called something like main underscore 10 or something to indicate that you know it's slower and just making it schedule itself for that amount of time later and this will just effectively create a loop once you play it one time it will continue playing itself once every 10 ticks so I can make something happen at a much slower rate and uh, make it a lot more efficient. The game will lag less if, say, I generate particles every half a second as opposed to 20 times a second. When dealing with large amounts of commands and large amounts of checks, it can be good to break it off into a function tree. Why check a ton of things at one time when you can instead check branches of functions that go deeper and deeper until you reach the solution? Breaking things into a function tree can greatly decrease the complexity and reduce the overall amount of commands it takes to accomplish one task. For example, in my block serializer, I use this method to find what block it is a lot faster. So instead of checking 11,600 blocks, I instead only have to do 27 block checks using a combination of tags and function trees. And similarly with the scoreboard side, you can check if a scoreboard is between say one and five, or six and 10. If it's between one and five, then break into one function lower that can check between, uh, is it between one and two or three and five? And you can keep going deeper until you get to, is it one or is it two? And what this will do is it'll reduce the overall amount of commands. You can look up a binary search tree, what I just described, or there's other methods or other reasons to create some form of function branches and function trees. Really the main thing that you want to accomplish with this is reducing the amount of commands that you have to com constantly play. So when you create a tree or create subfolders and subcategories, you can use uh, specifiers to help reduce the amount of commands that get played. For example, if you don't, if you're not doing a binary search tree, you can still utilize this where you say, well, is this does this entity exist in the game? If it doesn't, just stop now. This basically will allow you to have less commands in your main function because you're doing less, uh, you do a condition before you run all these long sets of commands. On a similar topic, you also want to avoid repetition as often as you can. I kind of alluded to this before with the main function, but you want to use selectors as little as possible because doing a selector in the end is still doing work. So what you want to do is use, if you find yourself using the exact same selector more than one time, you should probably break it off into a subfunction. What this means is that if say I want to say execute at all creepers, 
TP them upwards, all right? And then afterwards, I want to execute at all of them and uh, put a block of air right where they're standing. Instead, I should probably just execute at all of them, play a function that does both these things without calling the selector twice. Now on a similar topic, you need to try and optimize your selectors. A good way to just get a little bit of that extra oomph, that extra efficiency out of all your commands is to make your selectors better optimized. And there's a couple of ways to do that. So first thing that you want to do is to use at E as little as possible. If you don't have to use at E, don't use it. Uh, it's the most powerful and it will try and look through every entity in your world. Then the next thing is, if you do have to use at E, it's almost always, depending on the situation, use some reason here, to actually add a type to it. So instead of just saying at everybody that has a tag, because doing everybody with a tag will basically look at every entity and see, do they have this tag? It can be better to add a type to it so you can to narrow it down before it has to search for tags because sometimes when there's a lot of tags it can be worse to look for tags so if you add a type it actually in some instances can optimize your individual commands and similarly to selectors themselves another good thing to do is to limit the use of mbt sometimes using the mbt command can get out of hand because there is a lot that goes into it and it's pulling up strings and large going through large pools of data so using the mbt command or forms of data as little as possible can help really speed things up and that includes doing mbt checks now one way you can bypass this to make it quite a bit faster is to use predicates and advancements to do some of these mbt checks that you'd want they're not always faster but if you find the right situation they can really help my last and probably most discussed way to optimize your world is actually using area effect clouds, or as many of us call them, AECs, instead of armor stands. So if you're not displaying an item, then there's really very little reason to use an armor stand over an area effect cloud. An area effect cloud has less data. It doesn't have to render models. It doesn't have to render an entity model. All these factors, as well as some others, contribute to making them way faster than area armor stands. In fact, in my own experience, I once had my zombie server running on armor stands to indicate where locations of, of uh, spawn points are and doors and stuff like that. And when I switched, I was basically getting horrible TPS. I was getting about 10 ticks per second when I should be getting 20. But when I switched them to area effect clouds, it just bumped right back up to 20. I could barely tell the difference. So for most people, I mean, if you're using one, then it's not a big deal, but it's just a good practice to use area effect clouds instead because they're way faster. And if you're having any trouble actually seeing these area effect clouds, you can hit function F3B or just F3B, whatever your computer prefers. For me, it's actually kind of hard to hit. So I just go around with assuming they're there, but it, this will show you the hitbox of the area effect cloud, which we can see the hitbox is basically nothing. So they're really just used as markers. If you ever need something, an entity to mark a location, use an area effect cloud. It'll probably increase your efficiency. So it's pretty much all I had for you guys today. If you thought this was useful, leave a like. Um, if you have any ideas of your own or things that you want to see, let me know in the comments. Uh, we can talk about it. But uh, anyways, other than that, guys, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.